So, my, so I'm going to talk about standardization from the, from the point of view of someone who actually goes and implements and verifies and does all that stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm a cryptographer and I decided to join the dark side. I decided to go into private industry and I work at Unbound Tech. So what does Unbound Tech do? So we, our goal is to prevent keys from being stolen and we want to prevent keys from being misused. If you're an adversary, you don't need to steal the key to do what you want. If you want to sign malware, you just need to be able to use the key once. If you want to steal millions of Bitcoins, you only need to sign one transaction. So for us, it's important to protect the keys. So how do we protect the keys? So now we have a very short video explaining how we protect the keys. Split into multiple random shares placed on different machines. These shares never get united, even when they're in use. So I have to thank the marketing department for this. But this is essentially what we do. Um, so what's the talk going to be about? Well, it's going to be about one of the things we're going to talk about is, well, we're cryptographers. We want to imagine the worst case. But in this case, I will find, think of, and from experience of my grandfather, I will explain what can go wrong from standardization. And we're going to talk about uh, lessons we can learn from civil engineering. And then I'm going to say, well, what good can it do? And I'm going to give example of OT and OT. I'm going to focus on OT extension to say, well, standardization really is important and why it's important. And then I, I'm going to talk about how we can make standardization nicer in terms of descriptiveness, how we can make it very easy to verify and uh, implement and verify the standard is met. So, okay, civil engineering is about designing uh, buildings that are robust that won't collapse because something, uh, you know, some strong wind happened. And cryptographers design protocols that are robust. So it's a very similar idea. And it's very easy to learn from other people's mistakes because it's free. They've made the mistakes and we don't have to suffer. So if we can avoid mistakes that they've made and we can take lessons from what happened to them, then we can use those experiences for our own gain. So this is, I'm presenting you Dr. Knoll. Uh, so he was an engin civil engineer on the CN Tower and the Pyramid du Louvre. So two, I think, really cool structures. And he's, he's a civil engineer. He's been a partner at his firm longer than I've existed. He's an insurance investigator. So he's somebody that, you know, when there's an accident, sometimes he goes and actually uh, explains what happens and gives detailed reports. So he's an expert. And he's also been on committees for standardization. And he's also, he's my grandfather, so I get to hear stories and his, his knowledge about what he thinks and what, what happens in standardization, why it's been a negative influence on his field, and I'm going to describe to you those things. So his view on standardization. So I'll tell you actually in terms of when I sent an email, I said I went to the NIST workshop, which was really nice, uh, standardization. I really enjoyed it, and I say I went to, a, I was part of a panel. And then he sends me back this response. Well, don't go too fast, don't go too far, because in my field has reached the point where it, it hinders uh, new design developments and innovation. And we definitely do not want that to happen. And so, in his opinion, he has a couple of things that why it's wrong. Well, because one of the things that became too com complete complicated and cumbersome. The standards became too big. Before, what was a couple of books became an entire library of standards. So you, you want to keep you know, your standards in checks to know what you really want. And, and one of the problems is that if you're always you know, focusing on trying to meet the standards, well, you might not have a good view of the overall problem. You might focus on too much on trying to fulfill the standards. So, so I'm going to discuss problems and solutions. So one of the things is that standards can be bloated. They can be very complicated. So as somebody, as the previous spe speaker said, well, we should have full-fledged implementation. Why? Because if you have to full fully, uh, if you have to implement your full standard, 
you're going to realize at some point something is way too complicated. So I have to read, it'll allow you to reduce the, the complexity of the standard. And of course, test vectors is very helpful because you know if you've done it correctly. Uh, then there's the problem that, you know, you, it can hinder new designs. If I standardize a primitive and then somebody comes up with a new algorithm or you come up with a new algorithm that improves that, well, if they won't certify it because you're using a new algorithm, even though you provide a proof, you provide formal description, well, that's going to be counter to why it would, it would be a negative for standardization. And so it, it's better if we, uh, standard, we, do, we mix, build standards in a modular way so that sometimes when there's pieces that you, know, you can really improve, that you're not stuck using those old primitives or the old constructions. And there's another problem that in the field of civil engineering, when they have standards body or they, they meet for, to create standards, often there's professors there who want to include their work in the standards, and then, but they've never built a building in their life. And this is ver can be very, you know, if, if I've never built a building in my life, then, and I want to add something to the standard, it might be counterproductive to people who actually build buildings because you don't have this experience. So I would recommend for NIST people that are going to build standards, if they have the chance, that they should do internships at private company to see how uh, you know, these protocols are actually implemented in their product. And an excellent time to do this would be, for example, when there's a government shutdown, because then they're free to do something else. So, so then the next question is, how can standardization help? So I'm going to talk about OT and OT extension. So oblivious transfer is one of the most important primitives in secure computation. There is so many protocols that build upon this primitive. And OT extension is a way of getting each individual oblivious transfer very cheaply. Oblivious transfer is a primitive where uh, the sender get, sends two messages. The receiver gets learned one of the two. The receiver gets no information about the other message and the sender does not learn which message the receiver chose. So how would you implement OT extension? As somebody who uh, wants to implement it currently, how are you going to implement it? Well, the first step is you're going to go to Google Scholar, and you're going to type in OT extension. You're going to look at all the relevant papers. You're going to look in a few links. And then you're going to see, OK, which one is the best? And then you're going to check, OK, this one looks like the best. Well. OK, but is it from a reputable conference? So let's see. So the second one is the, one, the candidate. Let's see if it's from a good conference. So it's from Crypto 2015. I'm pretty sure. You think that's a good conference? <laughs> so you, you feel comfortable going, OK, I've done all these steps. I've gone to do OT extension. It's a really good conference. And then you go, OK, everything's rosy, and I can just implement that. Well, yeah, you know, when things can go wrong, they can go, they go wrong sometimes. And in this case, there's two papers that recently came out that both show that most OT extension protocols are insecure. Um, it's a bit more technical than that, that there's ways to instantiate these protocols that are secure and ways to instantiate these protocols that are not secure, but it's still a major issue. And uh, yeah, and then, one lesson you can learn is that you know, these papers in these conferences can even be wrong sometimes. And standardizing can help ensure that our protocols are more secure than just trying to use the um, you know, conference peer review system, which is, has a lot of pressure. And then there's you know, extensions of that work. There's like correlated OT. It's a variant of OT where you know, instead of getting one of two cho messages chosen by this the sender, first of all, there's some fixed value that is selected. And then there's uh, each time you, they do a transfer, an oblivious transfer, well, there's a message that is given to the sender. And then the receiver either receives the message or the message XOR this correlation, cor this value, this delta value, we call it. And so, um, so there, this is also a very useful primitive for like garbling. And then, well, if you look at the best protocol currently there is, 
There's not a formal description of the protocol, and there's not a formal proof. So it's very, considering the previous thing that there was issues, and then you have this protocol that doesn't have a proof or a formal description, this is very dangerous territory. And standardizing this and making sure that these primitives are secure and a good building block will go a long way to making sure that we have that when uh, we have protocols that they're going to be secure. So, so how can standardization help? We can have good places to know. We, we just look at the standard and we're, then we're happy. We don't have to verify the rest of the literature. And I want to emphasize that there's many protocols in the literature that are just wrong. And then when you read the paper, you'll be happy. It's going to be efficient. And you'll have to read like many papers to, to see that it's wrong. Like for the example, the OT extensions paper that are not, that show that the original one has f issues, you have to go through seven pages of papers on Google Scholar before you see this paper. And then you have to read each paper very carefully. So it's very time consuming for you know, an implementer might, which might not have much time. Um, so one thing that would be good is to standardize OT and OT extension. That would be a great favor to the community, I think. Um, so now the question is how to improve standards. And um, so papers are good, but there's something about writing papers that's aimed for academia and that doesn't make it necessarily very easy to implement. So MPC in general is just challenging to implement for even for experts. And so how do we make papers easier to implement and understand? Okay, so first of all, we'll start with what we know has been done that's really good. Protocol decomposition is wonderful. I can say, oh, just use oblivious transfer here. I don't care what oblivious transfer you are using. I, this makes it so much easier because I can choose the implementation I want. Okay, but to see why papers aren't necessarily maybe not written in the best way for implementation, we have to look at a historical perspective. So, this, so excluding the participant of TPMPC 2019 who know the answer, does anyone know what the sequence is? I'll give you a clue. It's related to crypto. Come on, you seem to know what it is. Something about submissions. OK, somebody who already knows. <laughs> All right. So it's the submission page limit at crypto. So this sequence is the submission page limit at crypto. Now, if you ask me, 12 pages, how can you write an entire paper in 12 pages? That's insane. And so we wrote papers in a super condensed manner because we had 12 pages, because we were writing like if, if it was for a book, which it was at the time. And then we also used to tell a very funny, well, lie that's very painful for when you're trying to figure out something. This will be shown in the full version of the paper. And so I think that considering this history that we can do better. And so uh, the way we write and read papers, so right now we write papers in the style of if we were writing for a book, which we did before, but now we, most people who read papers, they read papers in PDF format. Uh, so I, I have a few rules that should make it simple, uh, to make it easier to read pro papers to implement and verify the implementation. So the first rule is simple. I, I, this is convention that's really nice for me. You might not agree, but assignment, equality, this. This makes it clear when you do equality, you can just say equals. Okay. This is a better one. Um, this rule has never, we don't, typically what we do is we write player P1 computes this, player 2 computes this, and what this does is it saves us lines of, for the protocol description, which if you compress in 12 pages makes sense, but now we have more pages so we can make it clearer. So how do we divide protocols by player ID or rounds? Well, we write it like this. So this is much clearer, I think, much less noise. And so then, you can ask, what's the next thing you can do? Well, now you can remove useless keywords. So locally computes is, if you know who's going to do the operation, well, it's completely pointless. So then you end up something compressed like this. Uh, two more rules. Well, sample, you can, 
you know, this is often you can replace it by a symbol. But then you can see, say, one action per line. Because often when you're describing protocols you see in the literature, they're putting multiple things in one line. But when you're implementing and verifying, what ends up happening is that you implement the first part of the line. And then you have to go back, you have to write that. Then you have to read the entire part of the line to get to the second thing. And then sometimes it's even worse because sometimes, you know, you have to jump in the, to the end of the, the, the line for the protocol description because, you know, they say something like compute f of x, y, where y is blah, 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 and then you end up jumping around and then it makes harder to verify, harder to implement. So then uh, just one line per thing. So in this case, you know, they'd say verify. And then you can just, uh, yeah, so I give the reasons. So you have to often reread the same line if you do different things. Order and code, you have to jump back and forth. And it makes it just more difficult to verify and implement. So then there's a rule that I often see this in text. I see, oh, check that this condition is true, and if not, abort. Well, let's just use a keyword for that. This, just give a semantic one, and then you don't need to have to worry about that. Um, so this is the original protocol, and this is the, you know, I think the cleaner and nicer one that you can actually do. And I think it's much easier to understand this than to read this. And then when you're implementing, you're just going to do each of these operations very easily. And there's another thing that this I, I, I hear. If you look at ideal functionalities uh, in the UC setting, they're often very heavy in terms of writing. You often see, upon receiving this message, execute this, compute this value, and then send this value to this. But then I would recommend coming up with keywords that you know, remove, which we associate to the given semantics. And so if I take something like this, which looks quite heavy, by applying these rules, I end up with something that I think looks much nicer. Then you can verify each of these conditions. This is literally like pretty much exactly how we would code it, actually exactly how we would code it, and it much, makes it much nicer uh, to look at and to understand. Versus this one that, you know, I will go say, OK, I'm going to add this line. OK, let me reread the whole part again. OK, now I need to add this line. Then I have to go, OK, now I need to add that. So I'm going to go back and forth, and this is much nicer. And uh, yeah, I'm a bit ahead of time, uh, but that's fine. I can have lots of questions, and you'll be happy to go early. So uh, there's a few things that to understand from the statements. First of all, from this presentation, first of all, standards can be harmful. And it's important to know that Yes, you can do harm by standardizing stuff and in the wrong way. So this is something that is something to keep in mind. But also standardization can be can give you a way, can give you a, like a safety net, can give you a clear and nice way to make sure that your protocol is insecure. Because for for it to be, you know, for MPC to become generally used, we need to have we need that it be robust, that we know that the implementations are really solid. Um, you know, tr try using some of these rules to simplify protocol descriptions. If you want, you can send it to me, and I'd be happy to you know, simplify the description for you. Me. You can contact me at samuel.ranalushi at Unbound Tech. And uh, you know, have fun. Come see, uh, come see uh, the dark side. Come uh, to private industry and see what it's like. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation for the chance to present. <laughs> what a surprise. Hello. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so, I, I like the rationale in the presentation, but I think there's one element that is missing, which is what is the, uh, what is the reason for standardization? And I think there, there's many answers, 
uh, and so one might be in a particular place trying to standardize something to be the the selected algorithm that is going to be used uh, now for th for everything but I think you've you've mixed into that the goal of standardizing for the purpose of having a better specification and a better peer review and if we is if we isolate that goal then actually there's no there's no inherent problem in actually standardizing everything that we want we, we could just call it papers version 2.0 you could even have a conference where people bring their papers that were already accepted and now they're going to specify it in a much better way and which much uh, better peer review so the comment i want to make is just that i think it's interesting to separate the the goal of standardization as as a way of improving the specification detail versus the potential role of standardization for the purpose of selecting the one algorithm that we want to use in detriment of all of, all of the others. Um, so, so it's more you, a comment than a question. Sorry. Yeah, so there's things that are, okay, so selecting the algorithm, sometimes, it, so sometimes there's so many trade-offs for algorithms. There's simplicity, efficiency, like if you choose an algorithm that's simpler, but maybe less efficient, that's easier to implement, then there's people that are gonna, you know, decide that they really need the efficiency. And, and so, yes, these choices can be interesting. You're right, there's different perspective of, am I an expert cryptographer? Am I somebody who just wants to use like a particular building block? And it's a hard compromise. There's hard compromises to be uh, made about deciding what to do. but having access to some way so that they can build it and be ha secure that they're using the right thing would be good. And s if they want to extend the solution, okay, so it depends on, h are you trying to standardize something that is narrow or something that is general? In particular, in, I mean, in my role of making the question, uh, neither or, or neither. Or both, uh, maybe. I'm just saying that the, the, the realizing that uh, a lot of papers are not well specified and they should have descriptions that are better specified, that can, to a certain extent, be modularized away from what is the goal of standardizing something to be the, the elected protocol to serve as the, the ultimate oblivious transfer that is going to be used uh, no, uh, I, I think force. the difficulty with that is that, uh, you know, academia is, you know, academics when they uh, publish papers, they're, they're okay making small compromise. They're okay saying, yes, this looks fine. And first, for, if you want to use these protocol, you know, in industry saying, oh yeah, I think this is fine, is very dangerous. And I think this is the, the, where standardization can help is really, you know, making sure that, you know, uh, if, I, I, if I use a sword that it's not gonna, whoops, <laughs> that it's not gonna crack, that it's not gonna crack. And I think that's part of the, 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 the reason why I like standardization is to make sure I have a sword that's gonna st stay in one piece. Before your presentation, I have like one, Concrete questions. So, it uh, looks like I appreciate your like space, uh, like listing all those rules to make paper like more readable, like more understandable. I'm just curious. Do you have like a, because it looks to me you are making like a suggestion to the syntax of like, crypto papers. So, for the syntax to be precise, uh, like to be specific, you I think you need like a formal models of how to how to express your like securities. Do you have any of those? Formal models when you um, listing of your rules. Uh, are you talking about formal specifications? Like yeah, it's image? like in the UC papers we use like three machines, interactive three machines. But I think you, when you actually read like a, write all your rules or specifications, like writing a program language, you need like a more formal models. Do you have any actually like? I, I don't know if you're in your like. Where no, you I, I, yeah. I think uh, I think at this level of specification, I think it needs to be higher, uh, high level enough that yeah, you're not I, bogged down uh, by by details of like how how do I send a message to others? Right, no, no, not actually not by like those details, but I mean like at least you need some some kind of like semantics. 
Um, are you talking about formal semantics? Yes. Uh, no, I haven't looked at formal semantics, but it would be an interesting thing if I can actually give formal semantics to what, uh, you know, to rules for formal semantics would be very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, two comments or questions. So, one was going the same direction as the uh, previous questioner. It would make a lot more sense if this was executable. So, I mean, for, for most lower level primitives, we now have a rule that you have to supply an implementation, so then it's also uh, non ambiguous what a certain line means, uh, whereas you just change the syntax and it's not even getting to what I would say is, is better practice by having like the different parties separated by distance. So when you use, for instance, the crypto protocol, the normal ones where you put a send for an error and so on, I find those a lot more um, detailed than what I see in yours. Um, but that was um, a comment on this. Um, if you plan Sorry. on going to that, I would rather ask you to specify something which can be executed than something which is just on paper still. Um, so get one more step, make it implementable, have something behind it, be it Python something script. Actually, yeah, that's, the, first of all, that's an interesting uh, research question. Uh, of whatever, you can take something like what I wrote and turn it into something more uh, some higher level description like I did and turn it into some, uh, you know. Yeah. The next talk is about, yeah. 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 Uh, but th th then you, okay, so I will say um, there's a compromise here because if you do that, then the difficulty becomes, uh, so there's solutions that could do, that I think implementations that do that uh, but then w what I think there's a compromise between doing that and then you end up with problems where if you want to debug, you, you're using your intermediary language and you don't necessarily have to access to like the compiler if you, versus if you write the code in C++, then you can ha actually have your compiler, it's easier to debug. And maybe, uh, maybe there's ways to make it actually uh, so I'm not a PL person, but maybe it is possible to make it uh, do exactly what you said and make it very easy to debug. I, I prefer that. And the other thing is um, I don't have as much confidence in standards as you seem to go. When you say, oh, I would really like to see O2 extensions being um, standardized because it makes it more secure, to me it means once there is a standard, it kind of closes the door on improvement. So maybe I'm more with your grandfather there on seeing uh, the dangers of standardization. And if you have something which doesn't need interoperability, but just something within your company, then why would you want to have standards rather than just ask for code review or getting more eyes on it? I mean, in particular with OT, we still see developments. We're still seeing stuff getting broken. So to me, this would be, it's not ripe for standardization. I, I think that, uh, so I think one of the difficulties for us is that we don't have infinite amount of time. We don't have like a team Mm -hmm. a large team of 20 cryptographers who are able to look at all the issues and, you know, can keep updated on all the papers and verify, uh, you know, all the latest improvements. And so sometimes the literature is kind of dangerous mm -hmm. and it's difficult to go through the literature and understand everything. Uh, I agree, but I mean, if then some higher entity says, hey, here's a standard, it does give you a cover your ass. You can say, oh, they told me to implement it. But it doesn't make your product magically secure. And unfortunately, history has shown that there is not so much attention by academics towards standards. So if you, I don't know whether you went yesterday to WAC, there were lots of standards. Basically, every presentation was showing at least one standardized and commercially implemented product getting broken and smashed, wow. often enough years later. So these standards have been sitting around and just they don't get to the attention of, of academics because standards are typically behind paywall. And so okay. to me it's like, well, if ISO IEEE makes a standard somewhere, I won't look because I'm not going to pay it. And you might think, hey, it's been standardized by those people, so maybe it's, it's better. Mm. Yes, that's... So I see that as a risk. as we set, a standardization body will tell, will convey to you, hey, this is good to implement, while actually nobody has looked at it. Mm. Yeah, that's that's something difficult to. Uh, thank you for. I mean, like that. that's, that's. This is not a comment of NIST. Everything you're doing with competitions actually getting lots of attention. That's a good thing, I think. 
but otherwise just saying, hey, could somebody please standardize it so that I get a, at least somebody to blame um, doesn't make your product more secure. But, sorry, I probably taking too much time. No, that's fine. 